Okay. Hey, Rick. Thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, give us a little background on yourself. Yeah, it's your thing, Brian. Uh, well, first of all, I've been in sales for about 30 years. And it's uh, funny because it's like the tale of two careers. Uh, first four years, I was all over the place. Uh, you know, I started out, it's like every sales cliche. I started out selling frozen food, uh, not out of the back of the truck. I, I literally had appointments. I'd have to go into people's homes. And I knew I was done when I had to go in and try to sell an Amish family once. I'm like, <laughs> first of all, they have no electricity, so they have nowhere to put the food. <laughs> and I think they're pretty good on their own food. So that was short-lived. Uh, and then I sold dating services, right? So this is long before eHarmony. Uh, I literally had to get people to come into an office and i try to sell them dating packages, upwards of about $4,000 for some of these packages, if you can imagine that. Uh, and then I uh, got into advertising. So I started to kind of head back into more, I guess, normal sales. Uh, and then I got into selling B2B cell phones, uh, which right when cell phones were starting to really become more of a uh, more commonplace. So I literally start, you know, I'd call on everybody, electricians, plumbers, I'd go to the bottom of a, uh, you know, large office complex, start the bottom, knock on every door, you know, said no soliciting, just plowed right through. Uh, so that was probably the first four years. And then I, I got into uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, which was sort of my goal all along, but, you know, they weren't going to take a chance on me until I had some sales experience. And then I transitioned into, uh, you know, I was with Pfizer for about almost 10 years. And then I, the last 16 years, I've spent with a company called Aegis Sciences, and we're a, a diagnostics company based in Nashville. So we do a lot of the testing for, you know, health systems, hospitals, addiction, you know, treatment centers, you know, all this crazy stuff you see out there with the fentanyl uh, cool. and so forth. Like, that's yeah. right in our wheelhouse, and that's what we test for. Start out as a rep, uh, went into management after about four years, and the last eight years I spent as a director. Nice. So you like all the easy stuff, huh? Yeah, exactly. You got that right. You know, the funny part about it is, uh, you know, my dad was in sales uh, and I'll talk about him, you know, multiple times because he's a huge influence on me, but he sold insurance for about 35 years. So the logical move would have been, we'll just take over his book of business. Uh, but I distinctly remember early in my career meeting him and his colleagues for lunch and we would sit there and I would listen to them just complain. They complain about their goals. They complain about their boss. They complain about, you know, commissions. Salespeople don't myself, do that. <laughs> right. And I thought to myself, why would I want to go to work for this company? Now, little did I know that every salesperson for every company in the entire world does the exact same thing. But when you're 22 years old, you're like, I don't want to do this. Uh, so I don't regret it uh, because the insurance industry has obviously changed, you know, dramatically since then. But, uh, you know, the path I've taken has been a little circuitous, but I, I, where I am, I'm very happy. I love what I do. And what was the impetus to get into leadership? You know, I, I mean, every everything I've done throughout my career as an athlete, uh, you know, even when I was in a sales role, I just I've always gravitated to a leadership position. Uh, it's just I'm comfortable doing it. I can't explain it. I don't think, you know, real leaders actually you know can. Uh, I think there's just this feeling, this, uh, you know, magnetic pull that you have. And uh, so I, I knew I love to sell. Uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, my in my heart, I consider myself a salesperson. But if I can help coach, teach, develop people who are also salespeople, then that's where I get my gratification. Uh, when I see a salesperson, uh, you know, succeed or a manager, uh, you know, because at the end of the day, right, my job is uh, as a director is to to lead managers. But I, I can't help getting down in the trenches with my reps, uh, you know, getting into the field, uh, you know, prospecting with them, calling on existing accounts and so forth. But at the end of the day, like I get the gratification seeing them walk across stage at the end of the year, uh, you know, winning their awards and so forth. Yeah, it's nice for me to win. But to tell you the truth, I, I'm one of those people that I hate to lose more than I like to win. Uh, you know, so I and if I see a competitor, you know, not, one of my colleagues in the same position as me winning, I'm like, oh, you know, what did I do wrong? You know, what, where did I fall short? You know, what buttons didn't I push? Yeah. Uh, and I still have that drive every single day. And what keeps you in this space? Because it seems like it's a tough space. It is brutal. Uh, it is highly competitive <laughs> uh, diagnostics, man. I mean, it is brutal. Uh, 16 years and I've seen it all. And, uh, you know, there's so much, uh, it, you know, it, you know, it's very, uh, it's like any business. I mean, I'm not saying it's unique to diagnostics, but the rules and regulations that exist out there for pharmaceuticals are pretty cut and dry. The lab space, there's a lot of labs out there that kind of tiptoe through the uh, raindrops uh, and hope they don't get caught. 
And unfortunately, there's a lot of physicians that uh, kind of have that same philosophy. So, you know, that's that's the kind of the end of the pool I don't play in. And I just tell my people, you know, that, that, that one of my core values is integrity. Uh, and I've sort of stayed true to that throughout my career. And I think that's what's kept me in it because I don't get into the mud and roll around and that sort of thing. And and, and I love the people I work with. I, I truly do. I, I've had this. This is kind of interesting. I'm, our leadership team that we have in place now, I think I last count were about 74 years combined experience in diagnostics, all with the same company. Uh, and we know when to push each other. We know when to pull back. Uh, we have mutual respect. Uh, it's a collaborative relationship. And, you know, that's what drives me. I, I don't want to go somewhere else necessarily and start over. Yeah. Uh, you know, because I just I feel like I'm in a good rhythm now and I feel like there's so much we can still accomplish. And I've noticed that when people get into leadership, they like building something. Yeah. Because as a rep, it's, it's fun. You make a ton of money, but it's kind of cyclical. Right. You, you get a new comp plan, a new territory. You kind of got to get get the adjustment to that. And then you, you run for 12 months and then it starts all over again. You're right. Leadership kind of gives you a little bit more building. Yes. Yeah. hundred percent. You know, and I think, you know, it's interesting you say that because that is, that's what it's about for me. And I just kind of look where we were when we started and where we are today. And just more importantly, like, you know, the people, because I hired, you know, some of the people that work for me now, I hired them when I was a manager, I hired them as reps. And then when I got promoted, I, you know, I groomed them to move into management positions as well. So we built that, but then taking kind of developing the next level of leaders and then helping people just see their true value and their true potential. Uh, to me, that's the fun of it. You know, I, I made the analogy yesterday and I think you'll appreciate this. You know, you talk to really good comedians and they always say, you know, I, I, when I look out of the audience, I, I zero in on that one person who isn't laughing and that's the guy I'm trying to make laugh. So I looked at my sales team and I'm like, which one of my salespeople am I going to really focus on and get the most out of them? You know, and I, and when I started doing that and I did stand with my leaders, it's just kind of, you know, transformed my, uh, my leadership approach. But uh, salespeople can kind of be a little squirrely, can't they? Oh, yes. There's no question about it. And, you know, and the funny, and I say this all the time, I'm managers, you know, we want our reps to be so successful, but at the end of the day, you can't want it more than they do. Right. And I see that all the time, you know, because it's all set up for them. Their territory is right for the picking, like the big, you know, the rep from the competitive lab is left. So, you know, it's like, all right, now it's right there. And they're just like, eh, there's no sense of urgency. You know, that's why all the time you talk about, you know, summit of excellence or president's circle or whatever companies call it. And you keep pushing someone and then they're like, you know what? You never asked me, but that doesn't really motivate me. You know, so, uh, you know, what motivates me is I want to like be recognized by my peers and my customers. You know, I want to, um, you know, I want to make money so I can support my family. So I think the one thing that I've really started to do is just challenge my leaders and myself to dig deeper and find out, you know, what my salespeople's why is. Yeah, because you might think it's one thing or it may think, well, it should be what mine is, but it can be something completely different. So if you're managing them based on this why and their why is over here, you're not going to succeed. I think that's probably in the top three mistakes first time sales leaders make is <clears throat> assuming everybody is identical to them yep, or they try and hire a mirror copy of them. Yep. You're right. <laughs> It yeah. doesn't, you know, how, you can't get 10, you might get one, right? Right. No, you're right. It's true. You might, you're right. Exactly. You might, you know, spin the the, the, the wheel and remember once in a while it'll land on the right number, but more often than not, it won't. Well, so, what was it the, like going from managing reps to leading leaders? That's a really good question. And, you know, I think about that a lot because the real challenge for me is like, so I started out with some of these people like that I know is they were my colleagues. Like there's a story, a good, good friend of mine, we've worked together since the beginning. He was my manager when I first got into sales for this company. Then him and I were peers and now I am his boss. So aside from ribbing him because we're such good friends, I say, you know, that was a tremendous challenge. And there was a lot of friction initially, right? Because, you know, he's like, how, how did this happen? How did this guy, number one, catch up to me? And then how did he pass me? Uh, you know, and I think we just had different career trajectories. I wanted something that he didn't necessarily want. And I think once he understood that, you know, I was going to work for him and I wanted everything I did was designed to help him and his reps be successful. And I didn't have my own agenda. 
then the light bulb went on and he's like, all right, I get it. Now. You know, we're partners in this. And, and that's a real difficult thing because almost all the time a leader has another agenda, right? They want to take that next step in their career. And, and, and don't get me wrong, Brian. I mean, I'd love to be a vice president of sales. I'd love to have my, you know, an entire team underneath me. And I believe it will happen in my career, but it will happen when it's time. I'm not obsessed about it. I, I'm not preoccupied with it. I'm focused on the here and now and developing my leaders. And so when I do get that opportunity, that next person will step up. And then the rep that I've developed will step in the management position and so on. So you're yeah, able I, to separate yeah, your ahead, ego sorry. from the job, right? It, listen, it took a while. <laughs> but I'm sure there's people in the company that don't think I do that. But you always have to have a little bit of an ego to be in our business, right? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, I think that's good. I think that's what, you know, that as long as you balance that with some degree of humility, uh, you know, I think that's the key, right? At the end yeah. of the day. And I think a lot of leaders don't get, certainly reps want some autonomy. Sure. Right. Because they, they need to figure a little bit out for themselves. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're right about that. You know, and, and it, it's interesting. I mentioned earlier that I love to get out in the field, get in the trenches and, you know, I, I think it's it's very interesting because I see a lot of the polls that you guys put out there and the questions, should a manager make cold calls, should a manager prospect, so on and so forth. And I mean, the question is never, should a director do it? But for my position is, I mean, number one, I, I, like I said earlier, I love to sell. I want to be out there on my own sometimes because I want to see it with my own eyes. Like, because by the time it, you know, trickles up to me, it's been like filtered so much. That I don't know what's really happening out there and what they're telling me is happening out there. So if I spend a day and I just, and I don't ask for anyone's help, I literally pretend I'm a rep and I build the day and I said, so, okay, these are the 12 offices I'm prospecting today. And I go in and I just say, hey, we have a new rep coming to the market. I just wanted to come out. I'm doing some uh, pre-work for him. So when he gets out of training, he'll be ready to go you know, and go through the whole, uh, you know, the whole process. And I've learned so much about our business and about certain markets and literally about myself, uh, you know, and I think it gives me credibility and it shows everybody that, listen, I'm not, I'm not in it for myself. Like I, I'm not afraid to get down and, and, and roll up my sleeves and find out what you guys are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And then when I'm talking to my boss, it's not, well, you know, Joe in uh, Maryland told me this. It's like, when I was in the field in Maryland, I saw this. And this is an issue we need to address now or it's going to become worse. So I, I think it just, uh, it gives me credibility on all different levels of the organization. Yeah, and, and understanding and empathy 100%. for what they're going through. 100%. That's the key. <laughs> and, okay. you know, too many people who get to the director level are watching things through the numbers, the dashboard. Yeah. And they, they forget yeah, that it. somebody's entering that stuff to make you look a certain way. You're so right. That's it. I mean, that, that's it, right? I mean, that's the view I think of a director is sitting at your desk, looking at numbers, pushing emails out and text messages. What's going on here? What's wrong with this account? They haven't done this. And, I, and I'll admit, I started that way and I, and I hated it. And I was getting burnt out and I was losing my passion for the position. And I said, enough is enough. And I just said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be in the field as much as possible. And, you know, first, you know, people would be like, oh, my gosh, my director's coming to work with me. This is going to be a disaster. And once they saw that I was there to generally to help them get better and, and to remove barriers, then everything changed. Uh, and, and, and it's fun for them now, too. They actually say, hey, when are you coming out to ride with me? But then, you know, like when you talk to other divisions who don't necessarily do that, their reps are like, what? Your, your, your director rode with you? What did you do wrong? <laughs> yeah. That's it. If you can teach them that you're there to have their back and not judge them. Yeah, that's it. Because, you know, listen, I think I, I instantaneously have sir, some credibility because I sold in this space. Now, granted, when I sold in this space, it was significantly different than it is now. But that in and of itself, that credibility wears off after a while. Uh, and I think you have to continually earn it time and time again. Uh, and believe me, there's times, you know, in the, this time of year where well, I don't want to go up to Maine or <laughs> New Hampshire. And <laughs> Why <work>. not? <laughs> but, you know, I do uh, because I, uh, I know how important it is. Uh, I used to have like South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida. I miss those days because from like December down to February, I knew which reps I was riding with. It was easy. Because it's it, like, it... do I go to Indiana? Do I go to Maine? <laughs> 
So. Well, it, it's hard to lead if you don't really understand what they're going through. Yeah, that's how I look at it. You know, and I think that's, you know, fundamentally, that's a, probably an issue that exists within a lot of companies, uh, you know, is that lack of understanding, true understanding. Right. You know, you're a smart guy. You send to a certain position. You can put pieces together and, uh, you know, but ultimately there's nothing better than seeing it and experiencing it with your own eyes. Yeah, because, you know, I used to call it, you know, the bunker people. They were like, you know, the World War II analogies where they're pushing ships around in tanks. Right. Well, everything's yeah. easy in the bunker. Yeah. Go true. out in the front line. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit different out there. It's yeah, scary. you take a shrapnel and so forth. Yeah, and the other thing too, like and I mentioned my father earlier and he, uh, huge influence on my life. And like, you know, as I was younger, like I, I don't know how he knew, but he, and maybe he didn't, maybe it was just, it's all he knew to relate to me because he never played sports. So he would try, coach me in soccer, coach me in baseball the best he could. He'd go to the library, get the books, do the drills, all nine yards. But the one thing he could teach me was life and, and, and kind of sales and what he knew. And I mean, I remember specifically, and people think I'm crazy. Like I read Think and Grow Rich when I was in high school. I read How to Win Friends and Influence People when I was high, in high school. Uh, you know, when other kids are reading, you know, Catcher in the Rye, you know, these are the books I'm reading. And he instilled that in me. And I truly believe, Brian, I don't know how you feel about this, but there should be high school courses, at the very least college courses on those two books, Seven Habits to Highly Effective People and Starts with Why. If you bundle a course together with those four books, you will find your way in life. You will have success. Whatever endeavor you choose, you will find success. I don't know, does that make sense? Those books impactful for you too? Yeah, because I think too many of us, we, you know, school was designed for factory workers. Yeah, that's true. Good point. And, and sales, we're out talking to strangers all day long. Yep. You're right. And we think people think logically. Yeah, they don't. <laughs> we don't think no. They say they no. do. Right. But wait till they make a decision. Yeah, no, that's true. You're so right about that. But I always, I don't, I, it's interesting because I really, you know, obviously since I'm a, I'm a learner, I, I love to read, listen to podcasts, the books on tape and books. See, there's an example, like how old I am books on tape. Uh, I still call them that. Masking Audible. tape or duct tape or. <laughs> right. That's the look I get. But, you know, I really try to get these, you know, I call them these kids because a lot of them are to me, you know, in their 20s, early 30s. And I get these kids to try to do this at a, a young age and make it part of their their growth and the maturity. Because, and I see sometimes, again, I see stuff on LinkedIn, the question will be raised, you know, what do you think about sales books or, you know, sales training and things of like that? And there's always this, you did, I know how to sell. Like, but. I mean, look at baseball players. Before every single game, what do they do? They take batting practice. They field ground balls. I mean, they every single day, 162 games a year, they do that because they're going to get better. They're going to get a ground ball they never had before. They're going to get a pitch they've never seen before, and you're going to get better. And that's when you talk a little bit about brevity, and you know, there's a plug for you. But I think that's cool because I tell my people to practice. Record yourself um, and, and just – Watch yourself back. You'll be amazed at how bad you are and how much room you have for growth. Uh, you know, so that's the kind of stuff I try to instill in these these kids. And I think the ones that have had more success than others are the ones that buy into it, at least to some degree. That's it, because in school, it's a test. You're right or you're wrong. Yep. Or, the, or an essay where the teacher interprets how good you are. And they go right. out in the real world, but that's not the way the real world works. And, and I bet before you go out in the field, you're in the car, flipping through the pages, going, what's the flow of the call? You know, what questions should I ask? How, how, what's my opener? How do I engage them? How do I get the next step? Yeah, 100%. Because I'm not doing it every day, you know, so I need to do that. Of course. So you're right. And, I'm, and I'll go in and I'll do the first call and I'll be like, God, that was terrible. I'll be like, so, but then I notice as the day goes on and in between calls, as I'm walking through it in my head, it just gets better and better and better. So I, I never understood why people don't take advantage because, you know, when you and I were first starting out, the only way we, either we get our, you know, our, our spouse or partner to, to listen to us, which they loved, or we do it in front of the mirror. Uh, you know, now you have so many vehicles that can help give you feedback immediately that yeah. we don't take advantage of it. And I, I don't get that. 
it's it is a kind of a different mindset. I found that people with performance backgrounds, sports, music, debating, anything that's subjective, where there's a coach. Yep. And so much of sales is counterintuitive. You're right. It's true. Well, what do you look for in a rep when you're hiring them? You know, that keeps evolving. Uh, I used <laughs> to have what I thought was the perfect uh, blueprint, and then I got burnt. And I probably took shortcuts in the interview because I was so sure this was the right candidate. And uh, it, I mean, we've all done that, right? You're like, oh, this is it. You just get that gut feeling and you're like, oh, I don't need to ask them that. I know. And then you get them into the field and you're like, oh, wow, I screwed that one up. Uh, you know, so now I grill them. Man. And I don't want to listen. Anybody can put anything they want in their resume and you can make what you accomplished your previous company sound like the greatest thing since sliced bread, which is another phrase no one uses anymore, right? But the uh, the fact is, I, I have kind of a wheelhouse now. Why, you know, for our particular space, you know, it's usually somebody that this is going to be their first job in the medical, you know, field. I, I don't necessarily want somebody that's coming from, you know, pharmaceutical or device or something of that nature. I want somebody that's maybe worked in like Cintas or Paychex or Enterprise. Good training. They're knocking on doors. They're getting kicked in the teeth. Uh, they're learning what it takes to build a business. Because that person, I can teach them how to sell our product. That's easy. It just takes time and practice. But you can't teach that resilience and that persistence uh, and that personal accountability. And the last probably six or eight hires I've made over the last four or five years have all fit into that kind of niche. And it's and, and the results have been terrific. Uh, so not, I'm not saying that works for everybody, but it has been working for us. And when you made a mistake in the past, what what question didn't you ask? You know, I go back a hundred times and, and, you know, I think about that. And I think what it, for me, it comes down to give me an example of how you overcame adversity. Uh, and I don't care if it was, you, you missed a sale or you got yelled at by your boss or you got demoted, whatever that adversity was, I don't care. Maybe you got cut, moved from the varsity to the JV. I don't care how far back you have to go, but what did that look like and how did you handle it? And tell me what happened next in your career. And I didn't ask that because I guess maybe I've presumed that the person never faced adversity because they were so smooth and they had kind of, you know, Rushed made it to off. the stage in their career with relative ease. And uh, it turned out the first time they got hit with any degree of adversity in the job, they were just like a deer in the headlights. They didn't know what to do. Because and, go ahead. in your space, a lot of the stuff is drop-ins. Is that true? hundred percent. Yep. Yeah. Right. And they're getting, you know, <laughs> and people, let's face it, people aren't exactly looking forward to somebody interrupting their day. I know. I'm I mean, a salesperson, of course. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I have 900 things to get done and now I've been to entertain you for five minutes. You know, so yeah. And that's tough. But, you know, when you take the thing, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I don't care what you're selling. It is a numbers game. Uh, now, you can do things to make the numbers work in your favor, obviously, like the things we talked about earlier. But the more dials you make, the more doors you knock on, eventually you're going to get somebody to – you're going to connect with people. And this person just – he could not get past that, the, the rejection. And and, and and then just – I kicked myself. But it was a learning experience, you know. So I have no regrets at the end of the day because I learned from it. And I got, I've got gotten better as a leader and a better as a hiring manager as well, which is probably the most important thing that I do is hire people. And how about the reps that either can't take coaching or argue when they get coaching? Yeah, I've, I'm at the point now, and I, I we've built a really good organiz organization here in the East, Northeast, and we don't have a lot of turnover, and we have a pretty good rhythm with our people now. So they realize, again, what I said earlier, like, we're not questioning how hard you're working. We're not criticizing you. We're trying to point out things that we've observed that we think can make you better. Uh, you know, so while there may be some pushback, you know, I kind of diffuse the situation. I'm a pretty calm guy. I was like, listen, hey, you don't have to get defensive. I'm not attacking you. I'm trying to help you. I think once you say that to somebody, then that changes the whole dynamic of the conversation. Yeah. So very rarely do I have somebody that stays heated during a conversation once I take that, you know, once I take the, uh, the, the stress and the anxiety out of the conversation. And how did you develop that style? Because that is a talent. Yeah, I think I learned the hard way because then, you know, I, I would watch and then I would raise my level. They'd raise their level. I'd go higher. And then it was just and nothing. No got one's listening. 
Right. And, and, and the next time we interacted, it was uncomfortable and there was just, and, 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 and then if I had to ride in the field with him, it was always hanging over us. And uh, no, that doesn't mean to say that I'm not, you know, I still won't push someone and challenge them and call them out if I think they're not being candid or they're not doing as much as they can, but it's just the way I do it has changed. And how can you tell when a rep is ready to become a leader? What? Well, I have an individual right now who's in a position where I think they're ready to take that next step. And, you know, and I just had a conversation with my uh, boss about that and some of the things we need to do. And I think, again, it comes down to, you know, self, you know, educate himself, right? I think there's some great books out there, servant leader, you know, uh, leaders eat last. Those are must reads for a leader. Now well, that's in and of itself is not going to do it. But, you know, I think getting him on calls, uh, you know, shadowing other leaders, sending him to the field and kind of a, a management role to kind of observe behaviors and make observations, not necessarily in his territory, you know, his div uh, area, because that could be a little, could awesome. be some friction, but I send him to another market. If I have new hires, I'll bring the new hires in. And I just want to see how they respond while also continuing to grow their markets and be successful is what they do. Because sometimes when people make the decision that they want to move into a leadership role, they stop doing the other stuff that made them successful. So I just make sure I try to strike that balance. And because I mean, I, I'm a big believer in promoting from within. Like anytime I can do that, I want to do it. How about if they have the wrong motive or the wrong intent? Maybe they're turning 30 and it's time to be a leader, right? Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I've seen that with my own eyes. And I, the guy who's my manager now, he what he's one of my most successful managers, but he, he wanted to do it probably about a year and a half before he was ready. And it caused, you know, it was, there was some definite friction between him and I, but now he looks back and says the best thing that happened to him because he believes he would have failed because he wasn't ready. Because at the end of the day, right, a sales rep says, listen, I've, I've won some of, you know, our circle of excellence, you know, X amount of years in a row. I'm always at goal. This, I can be a leader. Well, there's a little bit, a little bit more to it than that. Uh, you know, so I think it's just kind of pointing out to them areas that they can continue to grow, things they can do within the organization to kind of showcase their, their abilities, improve their skills. And once they do that and they understand that and then they, something clicks, then you got them. Then they're like, all right, I see it now. And as a leader, what do you think your biggest mistake was? That's, a, yeah. I think when I started as a leader, I wanted, I had success as a rep, you know, I had success as a manager, uh, you know, in some capacity, but then I, I think I made it too much about myself. You know, I wanted the, I wanted the success. I wanted the per, per, personal accolades. I wanted to walk across the stage and be recognized as the best. And it, it was transparent. Uh, I think I probably used when I was talking to you probably use words like I, 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 you know, I'm like, what am I me, doing? Me, me, yeah. Right, exactly. And like, uh, you know, I want to win, uh, you know, circle of excellence leader. I want to do this. And I was like, wait a second, you know, I mean, is this wrong? I'm not a sole contributor anymore. And I think for me, that, that was a major, uh, you know, crystallizing moment for me because everything changes after that. When you realize it isn't about you. It's about the people you're trying to work with and work for. And I think that's the, the key word, right? Work for. Um, and once that shift happens, everyone sees it. But it has to be authentic, right? Like I've seen some leaders will do it for six months or a year. And then when nobody's looking, they'll, they'll go back to what they did before. But, you know, my thing is once you've done it and people believe in it, in it and they buy into it, it, it changes, you know, the whole uh, dynamic of your uh, your team. Well, hey, Rick, really appreciate your time today. Where can people go to connect and follow you? Well, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Rick Sully. Uh, you can check me out there. And I also have the Sully Says podcast. Uh, they could check that. I'm not going to compete with you. Uh, but I, it's just another resource for people to learn, Brian. So I really enjoyed talking to you. I love your stuff. And I uh, hope we can chat again someday.